We're delighted to start the series today with Adam Lent from New Local, and I shall now hand over to Chris Johns, um, RCP co-chair and chief executive of BCT to chair this session. Diolchem fawr, Ian. Diolchem fawr, Jesse. Yes, I'm, I'm Chris Johns. I'm the co-chair of the Resourceful Communities Partnership, um, and it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce our, our first speaker for, for, for the Inspiration for, um, pers and Perspiration event. Um, events, somebody who's been absolutely key in some of the new thinking about the way in which local authorities work with communities um, and has set a lot of the the scene, um, uh, which has underpinned the whole the whole of the work of the RCP. So um, great pleasure to introduce Adam Lent from New Local and will be opportunity for questions and discussion once Adam has finished. Thanks very much, uh, Chris. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, real pleasure. Uh, to be here uh, speaking, uh, to be online speaking uh, to you all. Um, I'll talk for about 25 minutes, something like that, about uh, community power, obviously, uh, but also more specifically about some of the initiatives, some of the innovations uh, in the community power space that we're seeing uh, across, um, across the UK. Um, and uh, also sort of look at maybe some of the challenges that exist around that. Uh, but I won't spend too long on that because then I know that we're going to open it up to a bit of a Q&A and I'm sure people want to share their own experiences of some of the challenges and some of the questions they might have around how you actually do uh, community power. Uh, I should just say, firstly, that uh, for those who don't know, New Local is primarily a network of around about 70 councils uh, and some uh, increasing number of NHS bodies as well getting involved with us. Um, and that network is very focused on uh, peer learning and on this idea of community power. I'm also very pleased to say that we have uh, a few councils in Wales, a part of our network uh, as well. But we also do lots of research, influencing uh, and sort of consultancy type work around uh, community power. But the heart of what we do is our peer learning network for 70 councils. So everything I'm going to say today really is really drawing on my experience of working very closely with that network. There's not much or anything that I'm going to say that is sort of being invented in my uh, head. <laughs> it's all really drawing on my experience of what is happening in that network and listening to them and working very closely with them. So just kick off very quickly with a quick definition. What is community power? I think there's a broad definition, which is the idea that communities, however defined, but specifically communities in place, local communities, really deserve uh, more um, power, more resource, more influence essentially over the big decisions, the services, um, the infrastructure that so deeply affects their lives as communities. But in the work that we do in New Local, there is probably a more narrow definition, which is specifically about the public sector. Um, and how the public sector works. And that really is about the idea that the future of public services is uh, a future that is much more community led, where um, public services are essentially seen as a collaboration between the public sector institution and the wider community uh, that they serve. And while that might sound like sort of quite an obvious thing, and many people do sometimes say to me, particularly those who don't work in the public sector, will often say to me, well, that's just common sense, isn't it? And I'm like, yeah, it is, but that's not how the public sector has been set up over the last seven or eight de decades. There's been a very institutional focus. And so I'm sure many of you will be very well aware that it's all very well to say let's move towards this more collaborative community-led vision, but that actual shift is a very, very hard thing to do when the standard operating model of much of the public sector is so institutional and so top-down. But I'll talk a lot more about that as I go through uh, my presentation. Um, 
It has been absolutely fascinating to work at New Local over the last seven years and develop this focus on community power. And I say that because what we have seen, particularly, over, well, particularly since the pandemic, is a real explosion of interest across the public sector and also actually across the voluntary sector as well, a real explosion of interest in community powered type approaches, moving to this community led approach. Uh, and I think there are many reasons for that. There is a growing uh, evidence base uh, for the impact and benefits of moving towards a community power type approach. And as I go through some of the uh, innovations we're seeing, I'll draw out some of the benefits that we're seeing, which are encouraging people to adopt this approach. But I think there's one overarching reason that I pick up on as I talk to our network and, and wider. I think the key reason is the recognition that the problems that we now face as a country uh, and that local areas face are very, very formidable challenges. Um, we're seeing, and, and we've already had the word permacrisis uh, used. I think personally, I think it's a very good description of where we are historically as a species, as a world. Um, and that is having huge impacts on local areas. So we are seeing health inequalities rise. Um, we're seeing all sorts of challenges around ongoing economic volatility and uncertainty. Uh, a lot of that is driven by um, a big part of the perma crisis, which is growing international tensions. And now we have you know, full scale war in Eastern Europe and in the Middle East. These sorts of things have a massive impact on the global economy and hence on national economies and hence on local economies. So there's a lot of economic volatility and uncertainty. We're seeing the rise of political polarization uh, and extremism. And obviously we can see that particularly uh, in America at the moment and other parts of the world, but certainly the UK is very far from uh, being immune uh, from that. And I think many will remember back to the way that tensions were rising around Brexit uh, before the 2019 election. You know, it's not difficult to imagine similar issues uh, arising again in the future. And then of course, we've got the environmental crisis as a sort of ongoing challenge which is not about to go away anytime soon and is only going to intensify. So the challenges are absolutely massive. But at the same time, we have local government and the wider public sector having very constrained resources to deal with those challenges. Everyone on the call will know that the money and the size of the workforce available to the public sector uh, has shrunk very significantly over the last decade or more. That again is not about to change. So what we are seeing is a lot of public sector institutions and councils saying to themselves, we have these big challenges. We have very constrained and limited resources. We, have, we can't deal with these challenges on our own as an institution. We have to augment those limited resources we have with all the assets, the energy, the insight that exists outside our institution in the wider community. And really increasingly what I'm seeing is that idea is just really gathering pace and it's sort of becoming unanswerable. You know, not so long ago, I would hear a lot of people say to me, you know, I really wanna do community power type stuff in my council but there's resistance, people don't see the purpose, they don't see, you know, what's the evidence for doing this? There's, that still exists to some degree, but it's becoming much quieter. I think as resources become more constrained, and particularly since we saw the spike in inflation last year and the, the extra pressure that is placed on resources, it's almost becoming like a, a, an increasingly... I don't want to say mainstream because we're not there yet, but an increasingly irresistible argument that we can't do this on our own. There's got to be assets and resources outside the institution we can work with to address challenges. 
And that's just becoming a stronger and stronger argument. So sort of ironically, the, rise, the growth of the financial crisis in the public sector is actually now genuinely encouraging a more transformational approach to how public services are delivered. Now, in the work that we do, um, we see three key routes to taking a more community-powered approach in councils uh, and across um, uh, the public sector. So I'll go through each of those three uh, routes and I'll illustrate those with uh, some really exciting approaches and innovations uh, we're seeing and what the benefits of those are. So the first route is around voice. So this is really about opening up the decision-making processes of councils and public services, moving away from what has traditionally been a quite closed approach to decision making where decisions are really primarily and solely taken by senior officers or senior councillors uh, within councils and public services um, with no really serious engagement or participation from the wider community, residents, patients, whoever uh, they are. You would, of course, see consultations. We all know about consultations, but generally what they are about is generally saying, we've sort of taken a decision already. What do you think of the decision? And it's usually done in a relatively thin way. We're seeing a real shift away from that to a much more open, participatory approach to decision making. Um, so, for example, if you look at a council uh, like Camden in North London, they have really put using um, relatively formal approaches to deliberation and consensus building, engagement with their community at the heart of their decision making through things like citizens assemblies, which I'm sure all of you know about, but also using a number of other smaller forums and ways of engaging with the community. And sometimes that has been done like uh, quite in quite a grand way. So they held citizens assembly to develop a new health and social care strategy for the borough, but they've also done it down at neighborhood level, working with specific neighborhoods by establishing things like citizens' juries and other ways of drawing uh, residents into decision-making. Or you could look at a council like Test Valley, which is a, a quite rural district council um, down in, in Hampshire. Um, and they actually probably are the council, quite a lot below the radar actually, have probably embraced this open participatory approach more than any other council. So it now is really part of their DNA. So when they're developing their council plan or place plan, that'll be a process that takes a year to 18 months and is built not around um, deliberations within the council, but is really about engaging very widely with uh, the wider community. So they will do that through quite formal mechanisms like citizens assemblies and citizens juries but they'll also use a wide variety of much more informal mechanisms. So literally going out onto the street, into pubs, into places, and having open conversations with people about what they want to see from their area, um, using things like online uh, engagement uh, as well, a wide variety of, of techniques and methods that they use. Most interestingly, I think they've started to use that specifically around uh, issues around regeneration, so Romsey and Andover are their two main towns, and they have gone out to the communities in those towns and said, what do you want to see from town centre regeneration? Not doing it in that normal planning way of sort of saying, coming up with a, a plan and then consulting people on it and saying, you know, do you have any objections? But actually saying, here's a blank sheet of paper. Let's come together as a community to decide what we want from our town centre. Uh, regeneration and you know we see a lot of benefits emerging from that much more open approach the key one is that you um gather insight that you work you can't possibly have a, as a sole institution i often hear this phrase you know people 
are the best experts in solving the challenges they face. So when you go out and talk to people who face particular challenges, whatever they are, they will have insights and understanding that public servants, however well-trained they are, however expert they are, will not have that degree of insight into the challenges that people face. So in the end, and there is good research evidence for this, particularly for working with um, the most marginalized and uh, communities, you end up with better decisions, better strategies, better ways of, of dealing with issues. We also see improved legitimacy. So one of the things that has come through really loud and clear in the Test Valley experience is that councillors feel that they have much greater legitimacy and authority because they can show that the decisions that they are taking have been based upon genuine listening, genuine engagement, and their decisions and strategies that the community actually buys into. So, for example, around the regeneration scheme, and anyone here who comes from a, a planning background or from a council will know that planning decisions are often the most fraught, conflictual areas for any decision that a council takes. Their experience has been fundamentally different. It's been a positive, pleasant experience that the community absolutely buys those plans and buys in and feels they have ownership of uh, those plans. So legitimacy is a, is a big element. And then I think the third really big benefit from this approach is mobilization. So when this sort of engagement is done really well, it's not just about asking the community, help us as a public sector body make a decision and then you sort of pickle off and we'll go away and implement the decision. Actually, when this is done really well, it's actually about saying to a community, we face a particular challenge. How can we work together as council and as community to deliver that change? So it's a fundamentally different conversation. It's about a way of identifying that collaborative effort that the community and the council or public sector body can work together on rather than it just being help us make a decision over a few days and then we'll implement it. It's a fundamentally different way of working. So it actually helps with that effort around mobilizing the community and augmenting those limited resources you have as a public sector body. The second route is around how services themselves are delivered. So this is beginning to see services not as something that are solely delivered by the council or the public sector, but something that are delivered collaboratively by the public sector body working with the wider community. That can sound quite abstract, so I'll give you two very practical examples. So one is in Essex, so this is Essex County Council, have set up a charity outside the council to deliver alcohol and drug recovery services. And they're uh, gradually transferring their whole budget for alcohol and drug uh, recovery services into that charity. But what makes this really interesting and makes it community powered is that those services in that charity and that charity is gonna be largely run and delivered by people who are in recovery themselves. And if you look at um, the stuff they're doing there, they talk very much about the idea of the pe creating a community of experience of people who are in, or people who have recovered uh, from alcohol and drug misuse. So they're very consciously creating a community here that is going to deliver that service. And of course, the underpinning idea there is that the people who know best how to help other people to recover from alcohol and drug misuse are people who have been through that process themselves. So the ultimate idea here is this is going to have more impact, it's going to keep more people sober, it's going to have, uh, and that ultimately, which is a good in itself, of course, is also going to reduce demand on those council services, which is obviously something crucially we need to do with demand for services rising uh, so massively. The second example uh, some of you may have come across is the community appointment day in Sussex. Um, we covered this on our website. There's quite a lot on our website. There's been a huge amount of interest 
um, across the public sector in this initiative. Um, so this is, for those who don't know, this is an initiative in Sussex uh, with the physiotherapy team. So the physiotherapy team in Sussex had waiting times of about 16 weeks uh, just for a routine physiotherapy appointment for your first appointment. Um, and at the same time, that physiotherapy team were trying to move to a much more um, holistic, strengths-based approach to the delivery of their physiotherapy services uh, rather than traditional medicalized type approach. So the clinical director down there, uh, Laura Finucane, had this sort of inspirational idea, which was why don't we just invite everyone on our waiting list uh, to come along to a, a single day uh, at a leisure centre um, in Brighton. The first one was held in Brighton. Um, and give them physiotherapy support on that single day. But what was really clever about it was two things. One, all the physiotherapists were trained in doing strengths-based conversations. So the physiotherapists were not there to say, I hear you've got a bad shoulder. How can we fix your shoulder? The conversation they had was, what's the, you know, what is going on in your life? What really matters to you? And there were no time limits on the conversations. So the physiotherapist could really understand what was going on in people's lives that was an issue for them. And that may well be exacerbating or causing their medical condition. The second really clever thing was they invited loads of community groups neighborhood groups, support networks, charities along to the community appointment day held in this leisure center. It was actually held over two days, not just one day. And because the physiotherapists were having these strengths-based conversations, they could identify that, for example, someone might actually, the real problem they were facing was bereavement, not actually a bad shoulder or a bad knee. And so what they could say is, OK, there's a bereavement support network in Sussex and they're actually here. Let's introduce you to them. So it was almost like I think someone described it as social prescribing on steroids. You could literally say this person has got an issue. Let's introduce them to some sort of community support. Now, if you want evidence for how a sort of community powered strengths based approach works, this is it. So 500 people turned up to the first community appointment day. 30% of them were introduced to some sort of community support. 50% of people were discharged from the waiting list on the day. Uh, and only 10% returned to the waiting list afterwards. And most of them just needed some extra advice and support. Um, and the waiting list, waiting times were reduced from 16 weeks to uh, 10 weeks, literally just through that one initiative, Community Appointment Day. Now, obviously, it was so effective that in Sussex, they're now, they've now run more Community Appointment Days and waiting times are now down to single figures. And I think what that shows is, you know, leaving aside the community-powered aspect of it, actually, the route to addressing uh, demand on public services is better care. And that's a real lesson from that initiative in Sussex. It's not about rushing through people more quickly, shortening times that you actually have consultations and that sort of thing. It's about providing better care. If you provide people with better care, surprisingly, they will get better quicker. They won't be so ill and service demand will uh, reduce. Third route, I'm going to speed up because I've gone on a bit. Third route, culture, organisational culture. Every organisation we work with tells us that the most important route to taking a more community-powered type approach is shifting away from that we know best type mindset, which has pervaded public services for seven or eight decades now, that almost a sort of parent-child thing. We know best what our patients, our community, our residents need. So we don't really need to work with them. We just need to be really good experts. Moving away from that mindset to a mindset which is basically saying, if we're trying to deliver a service better, if we're trying to address a big challenge, if we're trying to do things differently, 
Let's start with the community. What are the assets? What's the energy we can use out there in the community to do that better by bringing our expertise alongside the community and working jointly? And that is a big mindset shift. It's a really hard thing to do. It sounds easy, but you'll know that any culture change is always really, really difficult. And there's all sorts of ways to go about culture change. I could talk about that for at least 25, 30 minutes on its own. You're pleased to hear I'm not. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples of how we see that being done. So Wigan Council, which many of you may know, has been on this journey for quite a long time, um, has done a lot of culture change stuff. If you go and look at the King's Fund uh, report on what they did around social care, you'll see in that report, their evaluation there, that a lot of that was about shifting behaviours, shifting mindsets. It wasn't about big strategic plans or restructuring. It was about supporting and working with social workers and others just to think differently and work differently in a more collaborative, strength-based, community-led way. They put a really strong emphasis on listening skills, for example. So they literally got in ethnographers uh, from university universities to come and train uh, frontline workers in listening, sort of completely uh, open listening skills. You could really listen to what the people you were working with, what they needed, and had a sort of completely uh, non-predetermined view, no preconceptions on that. A council like Adrian Worthing uh, has committed itself to training a third of its workforce in participatory, deliberative consensus building skills. So they actually have those skills to go out in the community and work in a fundamentally uh, different way. Uh, but the key, absolutely key thing is leadership here. Having a leadership team that is committed and clear about the values and behaviors that it wants to change in its organization. And then rather than just saying that, actually living those values, because culture in the end is all about emulation. Uh, basically. I think one of the most satisfying or fulfilling things that I hear is that when cultures do shift and when teams do move towards a more community power type approach, and I hear this over and over again, what I hear is employees of public servants saying, I am so much more fulfilled now in the work that I'm doing. This is what I came in to public service to do which is to work with communities to genuinely address the challenges and improve people's lives. I didn't come into public service to basically get through as many cases as I possibly can, as quickly as I can over the period of a week or a month, or whatever it is, to treat people as problems or cases that I just need to process. This has actually brought back fulfillment and meaning into the work that I do. And there are no teams that I've come across that have moved towards this more community-powered approach who've sort of said, we want to go back to the old way of working. So, you know, that shows you how that culture not only has impact, but actually improves working lives internally. And of course, for retention and recruitment in the public service, that's obviously absolutely uh, crucial. Um, I'll just end on one final example, because I think it is such a good example of how when you bring voice, a different approach to service delivery and culture together, how impactful it can be. So again, some of you may have heard of this example. If not, look it up. There's examples on our website. There's also quite a bit on the internet about it. This is Healthier Fleetwood. Fleetwood is a... Um, Coastal town, Northwest England, many of you may know it. Um, it, uh, like a lot of coastal towns, it has seen better days. It had a thriving industry. Uh, it no longer has that. So like a lot of post-industrial coastal towns, it has a lot of problems with deprivation, uh, a lot of problems with health and health inequalities. Uh, the GP up there, Mark Spencer, he'd been the GP for about 25 years doing the same thing that GPs do, sitting in his surgery, and as he put it, managing ill health, not actually making a lot of people better, but just managing long-term conditions. As he puts it, writing the same prescriptions, often for the same people. After 25 years, he'd had enough of that. 
And he was like, there's got to be a better way of delivering primary health care. He got out of his surgery, went out into the community and basically said to the community, um, we have really serious problems with health in Fleetwood. The NHS, my GP surgery can't resolve this problem alone. We need to do stuff with you. We need to do stuff in the community to address that. And what that conversation led to was a real upsurge of local community activity around improved health. Now, many of the things they are doing are not the sorts of things that you would ever expect the NHS would never do, for example. So one of the most popular things is a weekly sing-along where anyone is invited to come along for an hour and a half and just have a sing-along. And I joined in, which was great fun for me, but probably not a lot of fun for everyone else in the room. But it is just transformative because it doesn't sound like a healthcare thing, but it addresses isolation, which is a major cause of ill health, as you all know. It gets people a bit more active. It creates social networks for people to do other things. Um, there are loads of creativity groups. There are apps of activity groups. There are some groups that are much more focused on healthcare, like men's mental health and that sort of thing. Um, and if you go to Fleetwood, it's genuinely moving to hear people talk about how, you know, if it wasn't for this particular group, like a women's creativity group, let's say, you know, I was on, I would not be here. I was on the brink of suicide. I was so isolated, so depressed. But just being part of this group, this social network has really just been transformative. And I think, you know, and it's had real impact. It's improved health in the area. It's improved life expectancy. It's reduced demand on the local A&E service. Um, and it just shows, you know, someone like a single individual, like the GP there, Mark Spencer, you know, he went out to the community and said, what do you want to do? So it was all about voice. He changed the way the service was delivered. It wasn't about him sitting there as an expert saying, I know best, I've got control of the medicine. It was about actually saying, you know, you actually as the community know what's best. Let's join forces to deliver change. And it was a fundamental culture shift because he thinks very differently now about his role as a GP. His role is not to sit in a surgery. His role as a GP is to be out there in the community supporting, mobilizing, encouraging community activity. There's loads more I can say, but I've already gone on for too long. So I'll stop there uh, and I'm very happy to sort of answer any questions, but also would love to hear about, I'm sure there's loads of stuff going on in Pembrokeshire that reflects a lot of what I've said. Uh, so I'd love to hear about those initiatives as well. Thanks, Adam. That, that's great. A real, real, real tour de force. And, and thank you for putting things so well structured as well. So it's very easy to pick apart the, the topics. I, I was, I, very happy to take questions and, obs and observations. There's also some really interesting chat being going on. Mm -hmm. I just wonder, while people are gathering their thoughts, whether I could reflect one of the comments in the chat back to you, Adam, which is particularly around the question of culture change and how much that requires organisations to change their approach to risk. Uh, yeah, so that's. I think that's absolutely key. Um, one thing that we have heard a lot is a sense that doing this sort of community-powered work uh, brings all sorts of risk with it, particularly in those services that might have a lot of statutory and regulatory uh, context around them, things like children's services, uh, for example. Our experience is, is that is very often a totally full subjection. Um, that actually there are plenty of places now um, that are moving to a much more community-led approach around children's services, for example, and they're not falling foul of the regulators. Um, in fact, often the regulators end up congratulating them for taking an approach that is genuinely impactful. Uh, one thing that we've really picked up on a lot is that if you are concerned about this, you know, you have a team usually within your organization, which is your legal team, who are there to support and advise you on regulatory matters. Now, what we heard here from legal teams is they often feel they are brought in too late um, to the process of developing sort of community-led initi initiatives and innovative strategies. So legal teams do get a reputation for saying, no, you can't do that. 
uh, that's not allowed and being very risk averse. But what we hear is that actually, if you bring legal teams in very, very early, they will see their role as a more of an enabling role. If you say to them, this is what we want to do, how can we do it within um, the legal and regulatory framework? Then you have a much more supportive relationship. One other thing I'd say is we are seeing the balance shifting on risk because I think there is an awareness now that actually the status quo is more risky than change. You know, we are seeing uh, parts of the NHS literally go into meltdown and declare critical incidents. We're seeing parts of, well, we, you know, you will know, we're seeing councils all over the place now having to declare bankruptcy. The status quo is clearly totally unsustainable. So the balance of risk is changing. It is a sort of human um, characteristic to think that change is more risky than the status quo. I think that is now shifting and people are beginning to see actually we have to have fundamental change if we're to survive. Thank you. Can I also just uh, recommend people have a look at Rianne Bennett's comment in the chat, which has got lots and lots of thumbs up about the risks of not doing things as much as the risk of doing things. <clears throat> the Sorry, I'm still waiting to see hands up, and I'm very happy to take this to do. But one other point, which has got a lot of interest in the chat, was the question of how far, how fast shifts to community power can be taken, or do, does there need to be an acceptance it's going to be a gradual process? Yeah, it's not quick. Um, that's for sure. It is a it's a major shift, and it is not something that you can do. Uh, you know, overnight, over a period of months or even a year, it is often a major cultural change. Um, and that, well, that in many ways, you know, is an unending journey. You never fully change the culture of an organisation. There's always the risk of slipping back. So it is an ongoing process. It can take a lot of time. Uh, I think when you're working with communities, our experience is that it's very varied. So some communities have a lot of social capital. They have a lot of confidence they're ready to go. They're often willing to start a conversation about how they can work differently. And that's communities of experience, not just communities of place. Um, uh, so, you know, that sometimes can be done relatively quickly. I think if you're talking about communities, and I think particularly this is the case with communities that maybe are more ignored or marginalized, it can take a very long time to build the trust and the capabilities within that community to work in a different way. And with some of those communities, we are talking about sometimes years to really build that trust and build that, that, um, those capabilities. So this is not a six month pilot. Uh, if you're serious about this, you've got to commit to it long-term, particularly for the most uh, ignored communities where trust levels can be very low, there can be a lot of scepticism, people often feel very beaten down. But it's very important not to confuse that with a lack of ultimate will and motivation. People do want to make their places better. They do want to volunteer, they do want to work with the council, but it just, there is cynicism because some of the you know, the hard times that a lot of places have faced have been going on for generations, for decades. So this is not something you solve overnight. But I would really advise people to check out Lawrence Weston, which is a community uh, that's faced a lot of deprivation uh, on the outskirts of Bristol. There's stuff on our website. There's other stuff on the Internet. This is a community that has completely transformed their commitment to mobilization, to activity over the years. Um, and they are probably one of the most mobilized communities in the country now. And they just show that even a community that faces a lot of deprivation uh, and is pretty apathetic over time can become highly mobilized and do absolutely amazing things. Yeah, thank you, Adam. Somebody who works in an organization on the other side of the fence, if you like, working with community organizations, that rings very, very true indeed. A lot of you contributed to the chat on this particular point. Does anybody else want to add to that? before I move on to a quite specific question in the chat. Oh, okay. Um, there's a question from Sandra Bays, very specifically about how useful are neighborhood plans and place plans from your experience, Adam? Well, I think 
are we talking, can I just ask, are we talking specifically here in the space of uh, regeneration and planning, or are we talking sort of more broader plans? Sandra, do you want to clarify that one? Right. I, I, Sorry, I, um, broader plans. Ah, right, okay. Yeah, because, you know, there's sort of neighbourhood planning, and uh, a lot of people talk about that. We're doing a lot of work on regeneration at the moment. Um, uh, yes, I think they can play a really, really important role. So uh, a council like East Ayrshire, uh, in Scotland, which has really moved very far down the community power type route, all of their work is based around the development of community, what they call community plans, which really are place plans, um, and basically making those the guide for the work that the council does. So essentially those are created by the community, working with the council, and they then become the strategy for what the council does and how they deliver services in the sort of areas they're going to focus on. Um, so yeah, I think they can be incredibly useful. I think it's really important that if you go down that route, you are absolutely sure that you have the deliberative consensus building skill sets uh, and approach. Those community plans cannot be created using the traditional consultation mechanisms. Um, so, you know, either have those really well-established techniques or bringing in some great organisations there are across the UK that are very skilled at running deliberative consensus building type sessions to make sure those plans really firstly are built around genuine consensus, but also genuinely inclusive, because you want to create processes that bring in as many voices as possible and get beyond, you know, just the normal, the usual suspects is the phrase that's used that normally engage uh, with those sorts of things, but they're not the only route. I think one of the most exciting things about community power is it's not a model. We're not saying, and no one has ever said, this is the way it was done here in Wigan, do exactly the same here. It's an ethos, it's a set of principles, and different councils, different public sector bodies will find different routes to it. That's why culture is so key, because I think if you shift the mindset, then you know your workforce will start coming up with ideas, start coming up with all sorts of different routes to having a more community powered approach. So yeah, definitely one really useful route to go down, but by no means the only route. So could I ask, how do you shift the mindset? Within the organization? Yes, and yes. within the communities. Yeah, um, so I mean, shifting the mindset within the organization and shifting the culture within the organization is you know, a massive challenge in itself. Um, I think the key thing that I see and the key thing to keep in mind is that, as I said before, emulation is the key to culture. People will copy what they see around them. It's almost like it's a human instinct to emulate. So if they see bad behavior, they will start emulating bad behavior. If they see good behavior, they'll start emulating good. So it has to start at the top. You have to have a leadership team, whether that's the leadership of a particular team or the leadership of a whole organization, that is really clear about the types of behaviors and values they want within an organization. And then they need to start living that themselves. If they start living, so let's say you say, look, we want to be much more outward facing. We need to be talking to our communities. The leadership team needs to be out there doing that themselves. They need to be setting that example uh, to, for others uh, to emulate. We see other councils using things like champions, so identifying people across the organization who really buy into this and are already um, uh, exemplifying those behaviors and values and sort of encouraging, supporting them so that they can be almost like seeds of different types of behavior within different teams. And then we see really innovative approaches to training and learning, making the organization a learning organization. So Wigan, did really innovative stuff around opening people's eyes up to the possibilities of a community powered type approach. I've mentioned Adrian Worthing, where they're really building participatory skills into a third of their workforce. So all these techniques together uh, really sort of generate change. And then there is the issue of changing the culture within communities, because a lot of communities buy into this mindset themselves. They buy into the paternalist mindset. You know, they're like, we pay our council tax for you to deliver change in our area. Why are you asking us to deliver this change? And I think 
that culture change begins with a conversation. It begins with an open, honest conversation about what you as a council or a public sector body can and can't do. And you know, this is where Wigan was really interesting because they went out to the community and very honestly said, all the things you want to achieve as a community and we want to achieve as a council, we can't do on our own. We don't have the resource to do it. We're being really honest with you. If you want to change this area for the better, we need to work together. And once you start having that open, honest conversation, then things do, do begin to shift if you have that conversation in the right deliberative consensus building context. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, Sue from ATEP, did you want to come in? Yes, I mean, I wanted to say um, a lot of our staff have gone on co-production training and we do seek very, very readily to work in a co-production style, but we're still finding it hard to get our communities, our customers, our tenants involved because they're busy working, they're busy getting on with their lives. They, like you say, the paternal element of them thinking that we can provide everything or do things. So I would like to say a lot of us are trying, Adam, but it, there is also a, a real hiatus within communities to want to get involved. So it was interesting to hear you talking about being honest and having honest conversations. Um, but yes, I mean, it's the power thing, isn't it? You know organizations giving power but also communities taking power and that that's where we find that the biggest hiatus in the work we're trying to do yeah yes um no absolutely and that's you know as i said the time uh, is is a big issue with some communities building that willingness that trust can take a very long time i remember that um so the equivalent of what uh, Chris works on in Wales in England is called Big Local. Um, and I'm sure Chris will agree with this. You know, I've heard Big Local, they gave a hundred, I gave a million pounds to 150, a million pounds each to 150 of the most deprived neighbourhoods uh, across England. Um, and they have found that, you know, with some communities, uh, it, I mean, I've heard them say five years to get to the place where communities really feel ready to start taking responsibility for doing stuff with that money and working out what they want to do. I think that's the extreme, but for some of the most ignored, marginalized, deprived communities, it can take a very, very long time. Um, and I think you need to be ready for that. I think some of the methods that I see councils and others using to try and get around some of those challenges so one is, you know, you don't, there are communities of experience you should be engaging with, not just communities of place. I'm sure you're doing that, but some communities of experience, um, you know, are often because they're coming together, you've got people there who are already sort of motivated to come together and do stuff are sometimes more willing to, to step up than particular areas. So that might be faith groups, it might be sports groups, it might be support networks. You know, councils do tend, understandably, to think about neighbourhoods and place, but actually there's often a wealth of communities of experience you can draw on as well. I think who leads the engagement is really key. So we see a lot of councils recognising that often them and their employees are not always the best person to start a conversation with particular communities. Uh, councils are enforcement bodies, they are bodies of authority, and often, you know, deprived communities have faced a lot of difficulties with councils. So they may be voluntary sector bodies, or it may be people within the community themselves who are best placed to start conversations. You know, if you've got particular people in that community who are active, who are mobilised, you know, giving them support. So Lawrence Weston is a really interesting case in point. Their um, activism started with people in the community going door to door and asking people what they wanted in the space, in the community. What did they feel they really needed? Not the council, but actually people within the community doing that. And I was more willing to open up and talk to people who lived in Lawrence West than they would be to talk to, you know, someone from the council. So there's all sorts of ways of addressing this, but I don't want to pretend or be glib that it's easy it's undoubtedly very, it's, it's a tough road in some communities. Thanks, Adam. Probably have time for one more question. Riyad, you've put it, you've typed it. I think you'll say it much better than I will on your behalf about uh, 
short-term frameworks and longer-term change. Thanks, Chris. I'm not sure that that's necessarily the case. Um, so, Adam, I, I'd welcome your thoughts. Of, you know, within local authorities, public sector, we are working within frameworks, policies, um, plans that are that, that essentially are short-term, a year, three years, five years. Yet, this work it, it takes time to build that trust, those relationships. So, we'd welcome your thoughts on on how those two. Um, sit alongside each other to really generate that shift in thinking yeah so i think there's i think the first thing to say is that i think if a whole organization or even a whole system is going to move towards a community powered type approach then yeah you need that long-term vision you can't keep working on the you know year-long plan or a sort of two-year fad, let's do this, and then everyone knows that two years, there's going to be another strategy in place. You know, one of the really powerful things about Wigan is that, you know, they came up with the Wigan deal back in 2011, and they're still talking about the Wigan deal. Uh, you know, they're not giving up on that. They're developing their plan for the Wigan deal in 2030. That persistence, that consistency is absolutely key to shifting mindsets and culture um, it can't be a matter of just sort of like, yeah, thinking this, we can do this in a year or we're going to change our mind in 18 months. So that's absolutely key, which raises the question, if I want to work in a community powered way, but my leadership, my organization, my system doesn't think in that way or doesn't have the right commitment, what can I do? Which is a really hard question. Um, I do, and, and the good news is, is that I do see public servants, I do see teams moving towards a more community-powered, strengths-based, whatever you want to call it, way of working, even if the wider organization and system is not always that supportive. Now, in the ideal world, you would want the wider organization to be supportive, but things can be done. And what I see is people basically just taking some risks, being willing to take the burden of risk because they're like, look, this I know this is the right way of working and I'm going to just get go ahead and do it as best I can within a not always friendly or supportive system. And often what I see out of that repeatedly is that actually they succeed, they have better outcomes, and then you see the wider organisation and system saying, oh, maybe we should be doing more of this. Case in point, uh, I haven't written it up yet, but I'll be writing it up soon. In East London, really interesting initiative around GP, what they call pop-up GP surgeries. I haven't got time to go into the detail, but the people behind that did that without re because they felt it was the right thing to do without the support of the NHS, without the support, really very significant support from the wider system. It's been so successful now that it's being rolled out across the whole of the borough. The same with the Sussex example I gave. They went ahead and did that. Their integrated care board, which is, you know, integrated care uh, governance system in England, weren't that interested. It's now really caught fire and people are starting to do it all across the country. So, you know, it takes a bit of bravery, uh, a bit of courage, but I do see people managing to generate change by saying, I'm just going to get on with doing this, take a bit of a risk, even though the organisation as a whole might not be bought in. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we have got towards the end of the end of our session. Um, Jessie, in a moment, is going to say a couple of words about what comes next, because this is, as she said at the beginning, the first of a series of events. But first of all, I'd like to especially thank Adam for his contribution, which has been really stimulating and got a lot of great, great reaction, as I as I thought it would. Um, so a, a big virtual round of applause to, to Adam, please. But also to all of those who contributed to the discussion as well. I mean, some really good questions. And I'm really glad to see some connections made as well between people in the chat. And hopefully that will stimulate some interesting developments as we as we go on. Um, at this point, I'd just like to pass over to Jesse then, who's going to just give a quick bit of information about the next couple of events coming up. Lovely deal, Chris. Um, and it's a, just to say thank you on behalf of Together for Change, PAVS and the Resourceful Communities Partnership. Thank you all for attending today. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Chris. Um, and for all of you sharing your valuable insights. We will be emailing an evaluation form to you all and would welcome your feedback. Um, the link in the chat shared by Kelly is to the second session um, of these RCP events on Thursday, the 14th of March, 
um, 12.30 till 13.30. And this will be a conversation between Selwyn Williams of Cumney Broad for Stiniog and Sue Demon of Together for Change. And it will be a session covering the challenges facing the economy and communities of Wales and how communitisation has enormous potential to both benefit communities and the nation, many of the things that have been picked up today. Um, thank you again ever so much and have a very good day. Diolch yn